So we had uh, started to talk about non-singular curves or non-singular points on curves. Um, so we wanted to show that the local ring of a non-singular point of a curve has um, so has the special structure that it is key valuation ring. So curve for us is still a variety of dimension one. And we will look at a non-singular point. So P in C will be a non-singular point. And we want to study uh, the local ring. So we had to recall the definition of a module. And we had uh, stated the lemma of Nakayama. Which is one of the most fundamental lemmas uh, about local rings. So let A be a local ring. And um, with maximal ideal M. And uh, we, sh we let large M be a finite degenerated So then there are two statements. The first one is, if it is true that this module does not change if we kind of multiply it by m, so it doesn't get smaller, uh, this is equal to m. This can only happen if m was 0 to begin with. Okay. And uh, the second statement was, and, 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 and this statement we proved the last time. The second statement is in some sense a corollary. So write k for the uh, quotient, which is the field, so the residue class field. So let f1 to fr be elements whose classes, so the elements in M, such that the classes F1 bar to FR bar of these elements uh, generate the quotient M mod MM, well, Either you could say as an A module, but uh, it's an A module on which uh, multiplication by M acts by zero. So therefore, uh, it is also just a K vector space. So basically it just means if we take elements in M whose classes generate the quotient here, then they actually generate M as, a theme, as an A module. So we had proven the first statement by some indirect argument, and now we want to prove the second. So we put N to be the module 
generated by F1 and Fr. Our task, obviously, is to show that n is equal to m. So for this, we consider the quotient module. So consider m mod n. So this is also an E module. And um, we, want to, we want to show that this module is actually 0. Huh? So we know that F1 to FR uh, generate uh, M mod M M. So in other words, so <clears throat> obviously what is generated by F1 to FR is n modulo mn, no? because n is generated by these. If I take the quotient, I get this. So, uh, so thus it follows that if I take n plus mm modulo mm, no. So if I take this n plus mm, I claim, what am I saying? So, can we just So I want to. Um, so we know that n modulo so say n plus mm modulo mm is equal to m modulo mm. No, because uh, this is precisely th these thing generate uh, you know precisely n plus mm modulo mm. No, it, one would think it generates this n modulo mm, but we do not precisely know whether n contains the whole of this. Um, and you know, it's just uh, we have uh, n is precisely the set of things generated by these. If we divide by mm, we, we get uh, the vector space generated by these. And uh, we know that this is m mod mm, so we get this. And uh, then obviously we can, <coughs> if we have, have this, if we add, if we make this n plus mm plus mm, then this will be equal to m plus. So it follows that if we take this, this is equal to m. No, because we have just, uh, uh, you know, it's just the inverse image of this under dividing by it, and it's the same. I mean, this contains mm, no, as we have put it like this, and we undo the dividing by it, so we get that this is equal to this. So, now we can look at, if we look at m, we have the maximal ideal, and we multiply it by m mod n. So we want to know what is this thing. We want to show. We now want to use the first part. Huh? That if we have a, a module 
which uh, multiplied by the maximal ideal stays the same. It was zero to begin with. So we have our module of which we want to show it's zero. And so we multiply it by the maximal ideal and want to see it doesn't change. So by that, what I just wrote, this is N plus MM modulo N. Um, <coughs> M, what? <laughs> Let's see. What am I doing? I seem to be a bit. Okay, I'm confused. I can see what I wrote originally because what I wrote in my notes doesn't seem to make complete sense. Ah, okay. Yeah, indeed. I'm not. So. If we do this, so I mean, how does one do this multiplication? This thing is, uh, will be m times m. No? This is a corresponding submodular n, except again, you know, if we want to divide by n, we have to make sure that uh, what we have is at least contains n. So we have to add n and then divide the whole thing by n. No, I mean, the, to take this, this quotient, if you multiply by n, which just means we multiply this element by, by the m. You know, so this is just the, the equivalence class of something multiplied by this is you first multiply the something with it, and then you take the equivalence class. So it just means you have m times m modulo n. But you know, if we want to make such a quotient, it always means we have to add this thing. Well, and now, the line before, uh, uh, I have just written that this is m mod n. So uh, with this, we indeed find that this module does not change when we multiply by m. So it follows by the first part of Nakayama's lemma that this m mod n is equal, well, so it follows if the assumptions of Takayama's lemma are fulfilled. <coughs> okay, so we, so if M mod, uh, so I, it follows that this is equal to zero um, because M mod n is a finitely generated A module. So Nakayama's lemma uh, the first half says if you have any finitely generated A module which multiplied by the maximal ideal stays the same, it is zero. Now M is a finitely generated A module. So M mod N also is because the set of generators of the quotient is the same. It's just the classes of the generators of what we had before you know, by definition. So if M was finitely generated, then also M mod N is finitely generated. Okay, and this proves the certain second part. So <clears throat> this is somehow very, I mean, this lemma is a rather simple fact, but one comes across it very often when one uh, deals with local rings, somehow the most basic thing that one studies. So somehow it's... Uh, You know, if somehow <clears throat> the, the idea is that you, you know, that you can just, in order to find out what the model, you know, what the generators of a model are, you just need to look at uh, what happens after you divide by um, by the max by the module times maximal ideal is uh, somehow very useful. 
and also this simple criterion to show that the module is zero. Okay, now we want to come to the definition of uh, a discrete valuation ring. So let A be a local ring. Uh, and assume that A is also an integral domain. So there are no zero divisors. So uh, we call A a discrete valuation ring. From now on, this will always be denoted just like this, DVR, because uh, it's a bit long. Um, if the following holds, so first, the maximal ideal in A is a principal ideal. That means uh, we can write M equal to T <coughs> for some element T in M. So the maximum idea can be generated by just one element. <coughs> and uh, in such a case, such a T will be called a uniformizing parameter. So, well, I mean, it was supposed to be small m. In particular, it's also in A. Yeah. There's no big M now, so now all m's are the same. Such a t is called a uniformizing parameter. Okay, the second statement is that, uh, well, you can write any element in A as a unit times the power of T. So when T is uniform parameter. So, so, so if T is uniformizing parameter, So by part one, there exists a, universe, a uniformizing parameter, namely the generator of M. And um, if T is such a thing, there might be many, but if I take any such, um, then every element A in A can be written. What? Uniformizing, yeah. Or oh, the orthography, with the, I, I write it with a Z. Now you might uh, object. <laughs> um, then every A and A, or maybe I write it every element F in A can be written as as uh, f equal to a times t to the n for a in a a unit and n a non-negative and integer. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so we know that um, uh, that you know A is a local ring, so every uh, element in A 
which does uh, not lie in the maximal ideal is a unit. So then we have the case that we have f is equal to a with a unit and n is equal to zero. So in that case it holds. But a power, <coughs> and now we want to claim that every element can be just written as a unit times a power of this uniformized parameter. That is supposed to be the definition of uh, this key evaluation. So let's make some remark about this. So if T is a uniformizing parameter, then uh, uh, if I take the nth power of the maximal ideal, the nth power of the maximal ideal, this is just the ideal generated by T to the n. So this somehow, and in fact, uh, so let's see. So this is for all n bigger than zero, n bigger equal to zero. So, <clears throat> so by definition, it's clear that t to the n is contained in the maximal ideal to the n because you know, t is in the maximal ideal, then t to the n is in the maximal ideal to the n. The maximal ideal to the n is the ideal generated by all products of n elements in, you know, you, maybe you remember, no? Maybe I could maybe write it. So by definition, m to the n is equal to the ideal generated by all f1 times fn with fi in m. No? That's how you define the power of an ideal. And then, Obviously, if you have t to the n here, this lies in m to the n, and therefore we have this. So, <clears throat> and uh, by definition, by, it is clear also that uh, t to the n is equal to m to the n for n equals 0 and 1. So, So the case n equals zero just precisely there says that uh, <clears throat> you know the units. So so the first one says if, if I take t equal to one, it says that uh, the maxima is ideal is generated by t, which is precisely our uh, our assumption. I mean on uh, the discrete variation ring, and. Uh, <clears throat> Well, the ideal generated by one obviously is the whole of, uh, uh, of the ring. No? So that's clear. So now we make induction on n. So we assume that uh, T, the ideal generated by t to the n minus 1 is equal to m to the n minus 1. Well, <coughs> so by induction, we have every element in m to the n minus 1 can be written as say, as, uh, say a times t to the n minus 1 with a a unit. And, um, and every element in m can be written as b times t with a a unit. No, I mean, can we, no, this is not our so just like this, every element in m to the n minus 1 can be written as a times t to the n minus 1 because where, where a is in a. This is just a statement that is gener generated by uh, that the ideal is generated here by t to the n minus 1 this by t. So thus... <coughs> 
uh, if I, an element in M to the N, it can be written as a, as a sum of products of one element here and one element here. So every element in M to the N can be written as sum of elements of the form A times B times T to the N for A and B in A. So it is in T to the N. Okay, so we see, so this is not really such an exciting argument. One just sees that essentially trivially uh, from the definition it follows that the maximal ideal to the n is generated by t to the n. And we see some one other small thing more. So if I have an element of the form a times t to the n, it will be in the maximal ideal to the n, and it will be in the maximal ideal to the n plus 1 if and only if a lies in the maximal ideal. So therefore, we find if I take a, um, so um, so if uh, F in A is of the form, so F in A is of the form uh, F is equal to A times T to the N with A a unit if and only if F is an element in M to the N which does not lie in m to the n plus 1. Because, uh, you know, <clears throat> if, I, if it's a unit, I can, you know, multiply with the inverse. So I see that it is, you know, that this element actually will be a generator of uh, m to the n. And in particular, it doesn't lie in m to the n plus 1. And uh, if it's not a unit, it lies in the maximal ideal, this element a, and so this product actually lies in the maximal ideal mn plus 1. Okay, so this is... So in some sense... <coughs> okay, so this was just this. So now I want to sketch the proof that the local ring of a, a non-singular point of a curve is a discrete valuation ring. So I will call this exercise because I don't do all the details and you could fill them in if you want, although I basically give the complete argument, but uh, without giving all the details. So we want to prove that uh, uh, the local ring that for P in a local ring, so for C, non-singular curve, no, for C, a curve, and P in C, a non-singular point, the local ring, OCP, is a discrete variation. Okay. So I just say, you know, it's all rather standard. Maybe some of it you already had in algebra or somewhere. So first, if A is a ring, and I an ideal in A, and we look at the projection, the canonical projection, from A to A mod I. 
then I claim that uh, if I take the inverse image of an ideal here, this map which associates to an ideal here, its inverse image is injective. So what I mean is, so the map from the ideals of A mod I to the ideals of A, which uh, associates to some ideal J, uh, its pullback, its inverse image, this, I, this map is injective. It's actually quite straightforward to see. I think it is also in, you also had it in the algebra course. I'm not quite sure, but the, at any rate, it's quite simple. It's almost by definition, but you can do it. Then one can use this. So if A is Unitarian, Uh, a Unitarian ring, and I is an ideal. Then we deduce from this statement here that also A mod I is Unitarian. <coughs> well, that's very simple. So if uh, we have a chain of, uh, if we have an ascending chain of ideals, so we use the chain ascending chain condition. So if J1 contained in J2 is an ascending chain of ideals in a mod i, then it follows that if I take the inverse image under this thing, it's also an ascending chain. So p to the minus 1 of j1 is an ascending chain of ideals in A. And it therefore becomes stationary because A is Unitarian. So after a certain point, all the ideals downstairs here become equal. But as uh, the pullback map was injective, it means that also the original chain becomes stationary. So this is uh, this fact. So with this we have, um, so therefore we find that uh, so thus uh, if uh, x uh, in the n is a uh, in, Close sub variety, then it follows that A of X is Unitarian. Because we know that A of X is KX1 to XN divided by the ideal of X. And uh, we know by uh, uh, <coughs> Hilbert's. Uh, Basis, basis theorem that kx1 to xn is Unitarian, so also e of x is Unitarian.
no, that we had. And uh, okay, <coughs> and then the third statement is so let x be a variety and p be a point in x. Then we want to show OXP is Neuterian. Well, you know, this is just uh, the local ring. It depends on any neighborhood of P. So we can take an affine open neighborhood. So we can assume that X is affine. On a neighborhood of P, we can assume first that X is a fine, and so then we can also assume it's a closed sub variety of a fine space. And we know, therefore, that A of X is Neuterian. And then, so I just claim that uh, by a somewhat similar proof to what is happening here, the map uh, which sends an ideal, so I say map from the ideals in the local ring to the ideals in AX, which just takes an ideal and maps it to its intersection with AX. You know, AX, so OXP is some sub uh, ring of the quotient field of uh, AX. So elements in OXP are quotients of two elements in, in AX, and I can view AX as a sub ring as of those elements where the, den where the denominator is one. And so if I have an ideal, I can look at all the elements in the ideal uh, whose denominator is one. And I claim, uh, and this can then any be easily be seen to again be an ideal in AX. And I claim that this map from the ideals in the local ring to the ideals in AX is injective. And if you have this, it follows that the same proof as the one of two will show that OXP is Neuterian. And in fact, it's a more general statement if you have a a ring and you do localization, then if the ring was Neuterian, it's Neuterian afterwards. Uh, but here you can see, I mean, I can maybe repeat what the same proof is. Assume you have a chain of ideals in, uh, in OXP, an ascending chain of ideals in OXP. Then I can take the intersection here for each of the ideals in the chain, I can take the intersection with AX. So I have a chain of ideals in AX. Because AX is Neuterian, this, this chain becomes stationary. So from some point, they all become equal. But as this map was injective, it means that also here, the corresponding elements become equal. And so the chain is constant here. And this is the Neuterianity. So the exercise was actually show, to show that this thing is a Neuterian ring. 
And now we want to use this to show that it's a discrete valuation ring, but that I actually will prove properly. So theorem. So let P be a non-singular point on a curve C, then OCP is a discrete variation. So we know that OCP is a subring of the function field of C, which is a field. No, I mean it's defined as a subring of the function field. The local ring is always defined as a subring of the function field, so a field. So if you have a subring of a field, it certainly is a discrete valuation rate. Uh, it certainly is a, an integral domain. Because uh, a field certainly does not contain zero divisors. So we have seen that OCP is Neutrian. So let M be the maximal idea. Then we know to begin with that M is finitely generated as an ideal because every ideal in the Neutrian ring is finitely generated. No? The Neutrian condition had, was two equivalent ones. One was with the chains, the other one with the ideal. So then <coughs> M uh, is finitely generated ideal or also, if you want, which is the same as being finally generated as an OCP module, because uh, OCP is unitary. So, you know, remember that if in Nakayama's lemma, there was always the assumption at the beginning that uh, uh, whatever module we want to look at should be finitely generated. Now, the module we are looking at is actually the maximal idea. So, so we know that this point is a non-singular point. So, the dimension of the tangent space of P at X is equal to 1. of this vector space. And uh, we had seen that this is equal, so maybe I write one. This is equal to the dual vector space m mod m squared dual. No? That was how the, uh, we had the intrinsic definition of the tangent space was the dual vector space to the vector space m mod m squared. And we, now know that the dimension of this thing is one. What? Ah, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's what I mean. So this thing is equal to m mod m squared, and so then this is the same as this. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is for any any x, but now we our x is c. Yeah, I mean, okay, so finally, I got rid of some of the misprints. So that's this. <coughs> so we know that the dimension here is 1. 
So this is a k vector space of dimension one. So we can take a basis, which will not be very large. So let T in M be an element its class, say T, is a basis of M mod M squared. So I should say the dimension of the dual vector space is one, so the dimension of the vector space is also one. Hmm? You know, that's, uh, so we also have therefore dimension k of m of m squared is equal to one. Hmm? Okay, we take this element, and I, I want to claim that this t will be a uniformizing parameter. So, now here we are precisely in the situation that we have an element T in our module, which is M, such that if we take the class of the element module of the module times the maximal ideal, then it is a, then it is a basis. No? So if you have, you have a set of generators, which in this case contains only one element, of, uh, uh, so in, in the other situation it was, we had a big M, no? then it was M mod MM, but in our case, the M was a module, no? but in our case, M is just a maximal ideal. So M mod MM becomes M mod M squared. So and we have an, an element in the module, which is a basis uh, such that its class, modulo the module times M, is a basis of it. So it follows by the second part, part of Nakayama's lemma that we have that T, the ideal, is, is a generator of M. So in other words, T is equal to M as OCP model. Okay, which is precisely saying that T is a uniformizing parameter. So we have found our uniformizing parameter, and with this, therefore, we have uh, checked the first property of the discrete valuation ring, that uh, the maximal ideal is a principal ideal. Now, the second statement was that whenever you have a uniformizing parameter, you can write any element as a, a power of the uniformizing parameter times a unit. So in order to prove this, we will show something which doesn't look so very related. We will show If I take a new module or a new ideal M by the intersection over all N bigger equal to zero of the maximal ideal to the N, so I define this module, well, then this is zero. So we want to show that now. Then we will see why it shows the second property of uh, discrete valuation. So, <clears throat> now in principle, obviously, it could be that you know, if you multiply by higher and higher powers of n, obviously, this thing becomes smaller and smaller. But it could be that there is something which all of them have in common. But uh, the claim is they don't. I mean, and this is now actually very simple because we are, um, so m is an ideal in OCP. This is kind of clear. I mean, if you just look at the definition of ideal, if you make an intersection of ideals like that, just, you know, you need to see the sum of any two elements lies there and the product of any element with an element in the ring, and it's straightforward to see that this is an ideal. And uh, <coughs> now, 
we still remember that OCP is a Noetherian ring, so this is finitely generated. And uh, it is uh, uh, finitely generated because uh, OCP is Noetherian. And here it seems really clear that one wants to use this Noetherian property because you know, it's difficult, would otherwise be difficult to say, see with such an infinite construction that it would be finitely generated. But it's finitely generated. And you know, if we take, if we take M times M, well, well, this is, you know, just, you know, it's clear to, to see that this is the intersection over, over all n bigger than zero, m to the n, or you have m to the n times m. And, um, but, you know, if you, whether you, this is the same thing, you know? this is equal to m. You know? An element, if an element lies in all powers of the maximal ideal, it also lies if you want in all powers to the one higher power higher. No? So this ring does not, this ideal or this module does not change, change if you multiply it with the maximum ideal. So in other, so by Nakayama's lemma, the first part it is zero. And now, so, but what does it mean? So this means uh, every element say F in uh, OCP lies in m to the n minus m to the n plus 1 for some n. No, because, um, you know, it cannot lie in the, inter you know, if <coughs> all n bigger equal to 0. It cannot lie in the intersection of all of the m to the n's. So there's a last one in which it lies. And then if it's the last one, if the last one is m to the n, it doesn't lie in m to the n plus 1. So, and we have just seen before that this means that this means that f can be written as a times t to the n for a, a unit. Uh, oh, we had to, this made this remark where I had to said in the end that, uh, that precisely if the element lies in m to the n minus m to the n plus 1, it means I can write it as a unit times t to the n. Okay, and so this is precisely the second statement of discrete valuation ring. So we find we have a discrete valuation. Okay. So, I mean, if one thinks of it like in um, complex analysis, so a local parameter. Uh, or no, a uniformizing parameter at the point P, you know, you somehow should view this as a function which vanishes to order one at this point. You know, if you are in the complex plane, you know, for instance, the function Z would be, uh, you know, would have this property in, in complex analysis. And in, um, um, you know, then you, for a holomorphic function on the plane, you can say it vanishes to a certain order at a given point. You know? 
and uh, so and this would correspond to uh, maybe in our language that it can be written as a times t to the n where uh, a is a unit. Anyway, so what I want to say is that in such a discrete variation ring, we can somehow say what the order of vanishing of an element in the, um, so we can associate to every element in the, in the ring a number, which we can kind of think of as the order of vanishing. And so let me do this a bit more formally. So definition, let uh, again P be a non-singular point on a curve C. Uh, we define new P, a map new P from the local ring at P without zero to the non-negative integers. Namely, we put new P of F equal to N if and only if uh, N, if and only if F can be written as a times t to the n, where a is a unit. Okay, and as I said, um, and new p of f is the order of f at p. You can think it of the order of vanishing of f at p. So where T obviously is uniformized parameter T, uniformizing So this uh, function has certain properties which uh, are the defining properties of something that is called valuation in mathematics, so that's why it's called discrete valuation ring. So, so we have the following properties. As the properties, the following properties. So the first one is, uh, I mean, they are all very simple. So if I take new p of a product, this is the sum. The second is that if I take the valuation of a sum, this is at least as big as the minimum of the valuations of the two summons. And uh, we have um, that this is actually an equality if the two valuations are different. So with equality, if nu p of f is different from nu p of g. So again, if you think of this as um, you would think of this as order of vanishing of functions. So you, you see that uh, the sum, the order of vanishing of a sum of two functions is, is at least the minimum of the order of vanishing of the functions. And uh, if um, this order of vanishing is different, then, the, leading ter then the, the corresponding lowest order terms cannot cancel, and so therefore it is equal to the minimum. Now that's somehow the same as you have in, uh, in complex analysis or whatever. Or if you look at polynomials. Okay, and the third statement is F is a unit if and only if new P of F is equal to zero. Now, this I have already several t said several times, F is a unit if and only I can, I mean, here by definition, 
I write this thing as a unit times t to the n. And so this is uh, trivial. Um, the other two are also quite simple. So um, I write f equal to e times t to the n, and I obviously assume that a is a unit, uh, g equal to b times t to the m. Then obviously f times g is equal to a times b times t to the n plus m. It's not very surprising. And uh, so, <clears throat> and if a and b are units, then a, b is a unit. So this proves one. So in other words, it shows that one is completely trivial. Now the second one is ever so slightly less trivial. So we have assume, you know, one of the two numbers must be smaller equal to the other. So is we again use the same f and g and assume that say n is smaller equal to m. No, one of the two must be smaller than the other. So then it follows if you take f plus g. What is it? We just put it together. So it will be divisible by t to the n. So this is uh, t to the n times um, a plus b t to the m minus n. No? And so it certainly, you know, is a multiple of t to the n. So it certainly, uh, it follows that a uh, new p of f plus g is bigger or equal to n. Um, now, if these two, so which was the first statement? And now we have to see if these two are different, I have to show that we have equality. So if n is strictly smaller than m, then I claim, uh, then I claim that a plus b t to the m minus n is a unit. Okay, why? Because otherwise, um, if I take A, I can write this as uh, A plus B T to the M minus N minus B T to the M minus N. No, that's not very surprising. But the point here is, so if it's not a unit, then uh, it would be in M. No? So this is a different M, but I think you can uh, manage that. So we know that everything which is not a unit lies in the maximal ideal. So this thing would be in the maximal ideal. This thing is in the maximal ideal, so the sum is in the maximal ideal, which is obviously a contradiction because A was supposed to be a unit. And so thus uh, this element is a unit, and so then this formula says that uh, the order is precisely n, which is the minimum. Okay. Now we want to see, so we have defined this, this valuation, this order, on the local ring at P. Now we want to see that this valuation can be extended to the whole of the function field of C. So I can say for every, uh, which is again uh, kind of obvious in some sense, for every um, rational function on C, I can say to which order it vanishes or has a pole at my point P. So I can extend this thing 
to the whole of the of KC, but now it will no longer be a map to to Z to the non-negative integers, but to all the integers. Uh, if I can find it, yeah. <clears throat> so again, definition. So uh, you should note that if I take k of c, this is also the quotient field of uh, OCP. I mean, by definition, uh, you know, it's a OCP is by itself a subring of a K of C. But if we assume, for instance, that uh, we have some affine neighborhood here, then we look at A of X, then KC will be the quotient field of that. And here we have a, a subring which lies in between the two, and we take the quotient field of it, then they will be equal. You know, you have just, if you take quotients of quotients, it's the same as just taking quotients. No, I mean, anyway, you can work this out, that this is what it is. So it's somehow, <clears throat> we can view element of KC also as a quotient of two elements of OCP. And so we want to extend um, this valuation uh, to from KC, again without zero, to Z. Well, just in such a way that it is compatible with taking quotients, namely by nu P of F divided by G. So if F and G are elements in OCP, I take the quotient is defined to be u p of f minus u p of g. Okay. And uh, so you have to see that this is well defined. So it doesn't depend on how I represent uh, F divided by G as a quotient of uh, elements here. So if uh, F divided by G is equal to F prime divided by G prime, so then it means that uh, F G prime is this is equivalent to F G prime is equal to uh, F prime G. And then I can say if I take new P of F plus new P of G prime is this. This is then new P of F G prime is equal to new P of, uh, as these things are equal, F prime G. And this is new P of F prime times new P plus new P of G. And we can now bring uh, this to the other side. So it follows that new P of F means new P of G is equal to new P. So I put this, subtracted this, and I subtract this, new P of F prime minus new P of G prime, which precisely says that this thing was well defined. Okay, so this is again straightforward. So, so we have for any element in the function field except for zero, we can associate this number nu p, which is an integer. So, and then uh, I really want to really want to have this intuition. So let h be an element in Kc. 
So the n equal mu p of h, then we say h has a, a zero of order n if n is bigger than zero and h has a you know at p huh, has a pole at p of order minus n if n is smaller than zero. Okay, we just say this is uh, just the words huh? we want to say, and you know, it somehow is like you have uh, and maybe I should say. You know, uh, so the simplest case of a curve, a curve is obviously if C is A1. You know? And um, so then it is easy to see that, uh, so take our point P to be zero. Then the maximal ideal will be equal to the ideal generated by x. No? So the thing which vanishes there, so it, or the class in the, okay. And so, P is, the point. P is uh, the point zero, yeah. Um, if you want, it's a, uh, one tuple, but uh, anyway. So, <clears throat> and then we see that, um, and so if then, if uh, f is a rational function, in x, so we can write, uh, yeah, so x, f, is equal to g of x divided by h of x. Um, then um, an x, then you know, obviously we can say what the order of zero of g at zero is. No, it's by what power it is divisible. So. So, so G is equal to uh, X to the L times uh, G prime with G prime of zero is different from zero. I mean, G prime doesn't mean derivative, it's just another G, no? And uh, H is equal to X to the M times H prime with um, h prime of zero is different from zero. And then obviously we would, would get according to this definition that uh, f, that new p of f is equal to l minus m. In this particular case, we can obviously just also, we can pull out the factor x to the m minus x to the l and the rest would be a unit at the point zero. So, and that's actually the next thing we will see. Okay, anyway, we can see that in this trivial case, it does precisely everything you know, the way you expect, no? It's just the order of zero, the order of pole in the obvious sense. But um, one thing that we have just seen here, which we will show, is that we obviously also have that F can be written as um, x to the l minus m times g prime divided by h prime. No, we just have pulled this out. Um, and um, now these are both non-zero, so this is uh, 
this actually is a unit at zero. Is a, is a unit in um, O A1 comma zero. So that is, we have found that in this particular case, if the order of an element in the quotient field is something, we can write it as a unit times the uniformizing parameter to the something, where this power can be both positive or negative. And the claim is that this holds in general, and this kind of obvious. <coughs> Namely, the following corollary. In corollary to the definition in some sense. So let P be an, again a non singular point. On a curve C. So first, uh, so if we take an element in the in the function field, then the order of this element is if and only if we can there is a unit only if there is a unit. Or maybe I can just add it directly. So we can write F is equal to A times T to the new P of F for T uniformizing parameter uh, yeah. and uh, a, a unit. So before, you know, in the definition, we had required this for any element in the local ring. Now the same statement is true for any element uh, in the function field, but uh, these powers can be negative. And the second statement is that if I write such a thing, an element here, in this for, so that if I know the order of the element, it will be in the local ring if and only if the order is non-negative. So OCP now is equal to the set of all F in KC. such that the order of f is non-negative. Obviously, you have to back, add back the zero. So an element in the uh, function field will be uh, actually in the local ring if and only if its order is non-negative. So which is, again, in some sense, you know, if the, it matches with the intuition, it is in the local ring if and only if it doesn't have a pole at the point. No? So if this, these words have some meaning, uh, then this would, should be clear. I mean, but as we just have, as we have just de defined these words, it's not like from the fact that we call something in some way, we cannot deduce that anything is true. Okay. So we have this statement. So let's see. It's actually quite simple. By our definition, so, so you see we have in some sense a simpler description of uh, what this order is. No, we can always write an element as a uniformizing parameter times a unit, uniformizing par parameter to some power. But also negative powers are allowed. So. We know, by definition, that nu p of f will be equal to n if and only if we can write f equal to g divided by h, where uh, g and h are elements in the local ring. And uh, 
we have the difference of the uh, valuations Rn. Well, but for elements in the local ring, we know how the if it has a certain valuation that we have this kind of statement. So it follows. Um, so equivalently, yeah, I exchanged. Uh, it would have been norm more natural to call this thing H and to call it F divided by G, but as I didn't, I have to match it. Okay. So equivalently, there exists uh, some numbers such that G can be written as A times T to the, say, M plus N, and um, uh, H can be written as B times T to the M for A and B units. And uh, M some positive integer. No? We know that uh, you know, this would mean the, the variation of G is M plus N. It must for some M. And the variation of H is M. And it must be true for some m because the difference is n. So, <clears throat> well, but then, you know, I can just, you know, I look at g divided by h, so why don't I just divide them? So, thus, Uh, F is equal to G divided by H is equal to, uh, what is it? A divided by B times T to the N. And um, A and B are units, so A divided by B is also a unit. So it's um, really very simple. And now the second statement is even a little bit sim simpler. So we know if F lies in the local ring, then its valuation is non-negative. Because we know that then it can be written as a, a unit times t to the n for some n, for some positive, non-negative n. Conversely, let <clears throat> I mean it's actually triviality, but anyway, let f. So we assume that nu p of f is bigger equal to zero. Then by uh, the first part, we can write f is equal to a times t to the nu p of f, where a is a unit. But this means, you know, T is an element in, o, in the local ring. If you take a positive power of it, we are still in the local ring. And we multiply by unit, we are still in the local ring. So this is also trivial. How much? Ah, my time is actually up. Didn't notice. Um, OK, we are almost. There's not so much left, so but I will just um, <clears throat> say what I want to do next time. So we want to use this to show uh, so use this so 
So if um, C is a say in non say a non single curve. And we have a morphism. Uh, so P is a point in C. We have a morphism which is defined outside the point P to Y, where Y is a projective variety. Uh, then phi can be extended. to you know, phi from C to Y. So if you have a morphism on a curve which is defined outside one point, we can always def uh, extend it to the whole curve. And uh, <clears throat> if the target is a projective variety. What? Yeah, well, except that, uh, well, I mean, the homework was a bit... Yeah, it was a bit different. I mean, uh, in that, you know, it was a different statement <laughs> that you have to prove. But so this is actually something that's a rather important uh, uh, fact for many uh, applications. So it actually turns out that under some reasonable assumptions, uh, this statement is equivalent to the fact, you know, so if you have the property that whenever you have a morphism from a curve without a point to a variety. Of, so assume you have a variety with a property. Whenever you have a morphism from a curve without, a smooth curve without a point to, to the variety, then it can be extended to the whole curve. This is essentially, equiv this is equivalent under some reasonable assumptions uh, to this variety being proper. Okay? So, because in some sense it's, you know, and it gives a more kind of nice, it somehow gives you better feeling for what proper means, namely really that no point is missing. You know, if you have a, a map from this curve without a point to Y, then the idea is, you know, everything is mapping somewhere except for this point. And, you know, this, the, the image point of this thing does not, you know, the point where you would want to map this point after having mapped all the other ones is not missing. You can put this one there. No? So, you know, if uh, this would be a fine, it could, for instance, be that this point would have to, you know, that you have some, that this goes off to infinity and you cannot uh, uh, do it. No? So it really is a... <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's actually the, the way... So in a slightly more abstract setting, in Hartshorn, this is called the evaluative criterion of properness. And it plays also a role, you know, that's the way that I would usually check whether something is proper or projective, because it's, uh, I mean, more useful for uh, kind of com in more complicated situations. Anyway, so this we will check next time, but that is, um, uh, and that's more or less it.